thing. Uh, <laughs> I hate it when that happens. Yeah, right. So, so yeah. but, but if you have a public that really is attuned to what science is about, mm. which is going into the unknown and not finding what you expected, and that's what really gets the juices flowing, then a result such as we didn't find anything at all, and therefore we need to build the next machine, which will take us to the next frontier, that would be completely understandable. Very interesting. 1-800-989-8255. Yes, sir. I'm Gene. You know me as Genius on, on Twitter. It was starting to remind me of uh, in Iowa, one day the, the wind stopped and all the chickens fell over. So I'm not finding <laughs> the party gone. <laughs> Back in the early 60s, I learned uh, studied physics. And when then it was told that to get close to the speed of light, it takes a little bit more energy. But a little bit closer, it takes a whole lot more energy. A little bit closer again, a whole lot, a whole lot, a lot more. In other words, you never get there. But my question is, with this idea of inflation, uh, I see that as the universe expanding faster than, than the speed of light. Uh, is it possible that, you know, under those conditions, that things really were sent out where we're out is uh, to us faster than the speed of light, and just that the light hasn't had time to get back to us? No, because actually, you have to be... We lie to you when, when, when in school. <laughs> we lie a lot, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> You have to be like a lawyer and parse it a little more carefully. Nothing can travel through space faster than the speed of light. But as far as we know in general relativity, space can do whatever the heck it wants. And in fact, inflation or not, there are regions of the universe right now that are expanding away from us faster than the speed of light. Locally, in fact, in, in general relativity, you can be moving at the speed of light and still be standing still. That, you're doing it now. In this room, you're not moving unless you have a lot of coffee. You're not moving very fast. But but relative to a radio audience at the other end of the universe, which isn't moving fast in their local surroundings, we're moving away at the speed of light. And, and that has profound implications, by the way. In fact, one of the biggest implications of dark energy, and as I found it poetic, you asked me to wax, wax poetic, I think one of the most poetic things is that it means the universe is speeding up. And actually, in the far future, everything we now see, except for our local galaxy and the region of galaxies, will have disappeared. The entire universe will disappear before our very eyes. And it's one of my arguments for actually funding cosmology. We, we've got to do it while we have a chance. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> What's a billion years here or there? <laughs> well, wow. could that be the, the dark energy beyond? Dark what, energy what we can't see. All right, thanks, yeah. for, thanks for your question. 1-800-989-8255. Um, uh, and not to mention those things that the spooky action at a distance things that people think try to understand, right? That's well, the, qu the weird quantum mechanics. The weird quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics stuff. is, I mean, I've, a lot of people have said it, that if you, if, you, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't. I mean, general relativity is easy, and, and in a sense, and, and special relativity is easy, because the, the mathematics isn't even that difficult to special relativity. But conceptually, quantum mechanics is just completely beyond our, our, our intuition, and, it's, and it fascinates people. We can understand how to write it down on paper, but, but to truly conceptualize it is, is really weird, and there's a lot of fascinating mm -hmm. experimental physics go going on right now to try and use quantum mechanics for fancy things like sending messages and, and uh, cryptography and all of mm -hmm. that. It's a, a great compliment to the panel coming in on a Twitter from somebody who says, Nat Rass finally says, I finally know what a Higgs boson particle is, thanks. How many times we've talked about this, but you folks have. Every time I get out of a taxi cab, that's what the guy says. <laughs> <laughs> there, should, that, there should be a TV show about stuff like that. You know, like a, a reality shows where, you know, not just the we, we CSI. We should have something where you see physicists looking for we this. We talked sort of about thing. that, actually, just before the panel. We all be stuck in a house, and people get to vote us off. It'd be really kind of nice. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> dancing, dancing with physicists. <laughs> <laughs> well, if the Waz could be on there, there's hope for anybody. Uh, do we have another question from the audience here? Please, if you're asking a question, step up to the mic. 1-800-998255. Um, let's, go, let's go to the phone and see who's got a question there. Let's go to Stephen Modesto, California. Hi, Steve. Oh, hi. Hi there. Um, my question is, what happens when photons collide in deep space? <laughs> what happens because when... After Go ahead. After 13 billion years of an almost infinite number of photons, um, I expect some of them have collided with each other. What happens to that energy? All right. We'll see what we can do. Let me just remind everybody that uh, this is Science Friday from NPR News. I'm Ira Plato here at uh, Arizona State University. And uh, Michael, you had your hand up first? I'll go to Lawrence. Um, that doesn't happen very much anymore. So, uh, what do you mean anymore? Uh, the universe today is very, very big, 
and so the space between photons uh, is quite large, and so uh, the, the probability of two photons colliding is, is not very big. But if you go back to the past when the universe was much smaller, then the same number of photons occupied a, a lesser space, and so the, the chance for collision was greater. And in fact, we'll be talking about this this afternoon. This is one of the barriers to looking back to the very beginning. Because when we look at these photons uh, in the microwave background, the most abundant photons, they haven't collided for the last 13.7 billion years. And that seems like a very long time, but they last collided when the universe was about 380,000 years old. And because of that, we can't look with mm -hmm. our eyes any further back. And so it's one of the barriers we have to studying the earliest moments of the universe. But, but at the same time, it provides an opportunity because, uh, in fact, it, that's what's so wonderful about the universe is that the photons haven't collided, that the microwave background gives us a picture of what the universe looked like almost 13.7 billion years ago. That's why two Nobel Prizes, in fact, one of the people who won mm, them is right. in this room. But, but uh, uh, that's why it's so important because it gives us a baby picture of the universe. Mm -hmm. Did you want to jump in? Um, I was going to say it's yeah. also good to think about scale, though. I think when one says that the photons are very far apart, one needs to have in mind how small the photons are. I mean, in any cubic meter of space, there are roughly 400 million of these guys running around. So there are a lot of them. They just interact so feebly that it's rare in those environments that they would actually interact much. Mm -hmm. Yes, Stephen. Well, uh, I, I have to, though, support the questioner Every once in a while, even now, a couple of photons in intergalactic space collide, but their energy is so low that the only thing that can happen is two photons go in, two photons go out. Um, the the, um, the different thing in the early universe is uh, when you go back to the very early universe when the temperature was something like uh, 10 to the 13 degrees Kelvin, uh, that when photons collided, electron-positron pairs could be produced, charged particles could be produced. That can't happen now because there isn't enough energy. Uh, don't we have photons in this room colliding all the time? Sure, yeah, cause sure, light part, yeah. but not much happens. I mean, they collide, and right. who, who cares? If two, <laughs> if, <laughs> if two photons collide out in the universe, is, is there anyone around to know what happens? You know, like they still trees in the forest, they still make a noise. Yeah, uh, yes, Lawrence, did you I want was going to say that there, is a, there are, however, photons that do collide, and they're another one of our windows in the universe. There are objects out there, perhaps black holes uh, colliding or, or, or stars exploding, that are producing very high energy cosmic rays, which produce very energetic particles. Some of them may be very energetic photons, and, and they, they collide in the atmosphere, and we use those photons, and, and which pr then produce particles in our atmosphere to try and learn about objects from, from extreme distances in space. Mm -hmm. It's a very exciting area of physics right now. 1-800-999-8255 is our number. Uh, we, we better, than, better than to get into another topic of discussion, let's, let's get ready for a break, because we have less than a minute to go. Let me reintroduce the panel. Lawrence Krauss of Arizona State University, Michael Turner, University of Chicago, Brian Green of Columbia, Stephen Weinberg, uh, University of Texas at Austin. Our number, one 800 uh, 989 the, We're getting some of the best questions we've ever had coming in from the audience today. I'm just happy to sit here and not even look at my notes because your questions are better than ones that I would ask. Also on Twitter or at SciFry and also in Second Life, your avatars are hanging out there and sending in some good questions. We'll get to those. You get a free Science Friday T-shirt for your avatar in Second Life, so don't be bashful. Stand up and uh, put your hand in the box, pull out a T-shirt. We'll be right back after this break. I'm Ira Flato at Arizona State University. Stay with us. You're listening to Science Friday from NPR News. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations and from Disney Nature Films, presenting the new motion picture, Earth, in movie theaters this Earth Day, Wednesday, April 22nd. From the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, working to enhance public understanding of science and technology in the modern world. And from Constant Contact, dedicated to helping small businesses and nonprofits build strong customer relationships through email marketing. ConstantContact.com. This is NPR, National Public Radio. 
Ever lain on your back studying a starry sky, wondering if there's anything else out there? I'm Ira Plato. Join me on Science Friday for a conversation on the origins of life and the possibility we're not alone in the universe. You may be surprised where some scientists think we'll find life as we don't know it. That's on Science Friday from NTR News.